can we move ahead yes sir we'll start yeah it's on live now so we'll start now sir. yeah <clears throat> good evening doctors this is dr someshwar from shield healthcare thank you for joining today's webinar i request all the participants to post their questions in the comment box so that we will address at the end of the webinar and uh, let me welcome today's speaker uh, dr kameshwara sharma from vizag thank you sir thank you so much for joining today's webinar and it's an honor to introduce you sir and uh, actually sir doesn't need any introduction because he was a uh, one of the top rankers in mcet and uh, he did medicine from andhra medical college and later he did a master degree in general surgery with unrelenting quest of knowledge he did diploma in laparoscopy then fellowship in andrology in bangalore and married to dr puja and blessed with the two kids and suryavardhan and josna sriya previously worked as a professor of andrology in international medical school bangalore and came back to vizag which is his hometown in 2015 and started puja andrology and fertility center and his hobbies are listening to music and a favorite pastime is research work He is a black belt holder in Taekwondo. He is none other than the Dr. Ameshwar Sharma. Thank you, sir. Uh, and uh, before proceeding for the webinar, we have a short uh, web page launch of Shield Connect, which is a digital platform. Okay. I request okay. uh, Venkat Krishna to please share uh, Shield Connect web page. So Shield Connect web page is a dynamic and digital platform, and uh, which connects all the doctors in one place. And you can see the uh, today's speakers web page. We have created like this individual page for the most of the doctors. You can find their webinars in their uh, web page, as well as we have created uh, their past webinars, as well as you can also see their upcoming webinars. And we have created a blog page where you can see the. Uh, the blogs written by the doctors, and also you can uh, also see PCOS awareness page, which is available in the, all the regional languages. So this is for the patient education as well as the awareness regarding the PCOS. And also we have one more page on a leaders page, which we have uh, most of the key opinion leaders who are supporting this initiative of uh, digital. Uh, innovation. So, Shield Connect strives to improve the state of the patient care, adapting to the modern day practices. So, I request all the delegates to please do visit Shield Connect web page. Thank you. And uh, so, today's topic is unexplained male infertility. Infertility remains both the prevalent and problematic among couples worldwide. It is reasonable to assume that there are many cases of infertility that are unreported. Uh, when coming to the mail so i request uh, dr kameshwar sharma uh, to uh, talk on the unexplained male infertility over to you sir yeah good evening doctors and uh, fellow colleagues the thing today i am going to discuss about the unexplained uh, factor of male infertility uh, basically there are so many yeah. uh, there are so many myths and misconceptions sir Uh, prevailing in the treatment of uh, infertility uh, especially in the male infertility i will come with the short story of uh, my patients a young couple of around uh, 25 year old lady and 28 year old man came with uh, two years uh, duration of infertility and uh, that male is not able to produce sperm semen in the office he is not able to produce sperm in the home as well when he is asked to do so otherwise he is okay with his uh, regular uh, intercourse and all so the wife says uh, he is the culprit and uh, uh, she wants to even leave him but when i did a postpartum test 6 hours after the thing uh, intercourse oh, we found plenty of uh, motile sperms found there so then the focus of interest has gone from female to female part and the female is not uh, ovulating properly then we gave her uh, Uh, my own style and related things later ovulated and now they are blessed with a female child 
this is how the things work on uh, when we have to uh, properly evaluate the couple and with this introduction i will go to the um, infertility proper next slide please next slide please yeah in fact you all know infertility is the inability of a sexually active and non contraceptive couple to achieve spontaneous pregnancy in one year uh, in male infertility due to impaired spermatogenesis may result from hypothalamic hypothalamic pituitary or testicular disorders next slide please when there is no identifiable cause the patients are categorized as having male infertility of unknown origin the classification is further divided into idiopathic versus unexplained male infertility the prevalence of idiopathic male infertility is three times higher than unexplained male infertility say 33 versus 11 percent patients with idiopathic male infertility generally have normal physical examination as well as endocrine investigation testing reports with a decrease in semen quality in contrast patients with un explained male infertility will have a normal semen analysis this point we have to keep in mind next slide please uh, you you know the prevalence of uh, infertility overall in the world has gone up to 15% and uh, half of it is due to male factor next slide please how do we define unexplained infertility it is defined as infertility without a detectable cause it's not a diagnosis per se but one of exclusions this does not necessarily infer that there is no cause present but maybe due to the result of inadequate level of investigation or a failure of those investigations performed to reach a diagnosis uh, i can say uh, the thing is like uh, in in a rural setup in a small lab they say 40% or 70% normal spermatozoa are present but uh, that is not true so we can't rely on uh, all investigations unless it is tested in a an experienced center in a very experienced center that is that matters a lot next slide please uh, how and why to diagnose we all know we make a diagnosis with the aim to distinguish and make deliberate judgment to classify a specific disease the formulation of a diagnosis then allows us a targeted treatment to be applied and information on the natural history and prognosis of the disease to be treated uh, but unexplained infertility does not fulfill any of those above criteria so it's not a diagnosis but it gives us an idea how to go ahead in, in our investigations and management according to the guidelines the standard initial infertility assessment is indicated after 12 months of trying to conceive but may be appropriate at an earlier time point in older women Uh, say less, less than six months, we can start investigating. The basic infertility workup includes history, physical examination, and evaluation of ovarian, tubal, uterine, and male factors. As spotlighted later, these tests are sometimes problematic as they have the potential to miss the diagnosis, as already I mentioned, or over-diagnosis. Sometimes they come as morphology three, but uh, still the patient may be normal totally. or under diagnose the cause of infertility next slide please the potential etiologies of unexplained male infertility are uh, normal with they have normal semen analysis the following possibilities should be kept in mind number one presence of a female factor uh, inappropriate coital habits that means too less frequency of intercourse say one couple has come with they have intercourse only once in a month or once in two months definitely whatever may be the investigation result they are not going to have pregnancy and erectile dysfunction unless closely ask the couple may not reveal irrespective of their educational or status uh, they don't know uh, am i audible Yes, hello sir. Yes, sir. yes sir okay okay uh, the thing is uh, sometimes you know erectile dysfunction even the couple may not know he will be rubbing the penis on the um, vagina and introitus he thinks that uh, intercourse is happening and the female also doesn't know whether it is happening or not they come to the clinic with infertility 
this question unless we closely ask uh, can't be revealed and the presence of anti sperm antibodies and sperm dysfunction are the points of interest today so in the third and um, fourth and fifth factors that is autoimmune infertility it has been long postulated as one of the causes of subfertility it represents approximately 4 to 5% of male factor infertility so there are so many factors uh, there are so many postulates uh, saying that next slide please there are so many postulates why the sperm is uh, not uh, taken as a foreign antigen that's all that that, that will that will consume so much of time and uh, i will go to the next slide please next slide next slide please yeah you know testis is a, an immuno privileged site you know uh, that the sperm is produced only after the puberty and uh, at that time immuno tolerance has long been established but still the testis uh, has that barrier blood testis barrier which is comprised of the basement membrane as, as well as peritubular myoid cells they form an effective barrier so that uh, the sperm and its antigens are not exposed to the humoral immuno complex immuno system humoral immune system yes but the testis can provoke uh, its capable of mounting inflammatory response as proven by its effective cellular and humoral humoral defense against infections in pathological circumstances the imbalance between the tolerogenic and the efferent limbs of testicular immune response can lead to the development of anti sperm antibodies so anti sperm antibodies can produce an array of problems that we will discuss later next slide please so there are uh, so many types of anti sperm antibodies available mostly they are igg and iga IG, igg is present in the blood iga is present in the epithelial surface next slide please and what are the causes of anti sperm antibodies being present one of the major causes is vasectomy other causes include vas obstruction testicular trauma torsion malignancy infection of the genital tract semen deposition at non genital tract sites like homosexuals and perhaps varicose seed all these can pose uh, all these can present spermatozoal antigens to the immune system so it is still unclear whether the anti sperm antibody is produced locally or it is transferred from the serum Uh, among these sperm bound antibodies are most clinically relevant the antibody classes that appear to be clinically relevant in, are include igg and iga next slide please the epididymis is one of the site where uh, the sperm stay longer so obstruction of it can cause uh, leakage of antigens spermatozoal antigens and it will uh, initiate a cascade of events that release igg and iga anti sperm antibodies in contrast women also can produce anti sperm antibodies in her cervical fluid they have been reported in 7 to 17% of the infertile women varying with the type of test performed and the population screening you know that will reduce the capacity of the sperm to move it will lead to shaking movement in the postcoital test that i will discuss later and it will reduce the sperm mucus penetration as well as the zona pellucida binding and sperm oocyte fusion overall there is a reduction in the pregnancy rates next slide please so in the regular uh, uh, semen analysis sperm agglutination if you find you can think of anti sperm antibodies being present but you, uh, even in some normal fertile males they have they are proven fertile males Uh, they may have some anti sperm antibodies but still uh, they have, they may have some agglutination but still they can father a child so this is not like all or none phenomenon when no other cause is found then we think of this anti sperm antibodies being the cause so next slide please 
So the diagnosis of immunological infertility will require two conditions to be satisfied. One, fifty percent or more of motile spermatozoa uh, should have um, these anti-sperm antibodies. They are bound to the sperm and uh, they interfere with the sperm function. These things actually we have so many tests like immunobit test and mixed agglutination reaction, but nowadays uh, they are not frequently done. I have another solution for that. Next slide, please. So this is uh, actually previously people were performing and uh, in the 2010 to 2020, people thought that first quietal test uh, is uh, not necessary. It is an obsolete test like that people are thinking, but now there is a resurgence of interest on the post test because, you know, complement is required for the anti-sperm antibodies to uh, act, get activated. So that is there in the cervical mucus. So what we do is six hours after intercourse, we have to um, withdraw the mucus from a non-needled uh, insulin syringe, like one ml syringe. Uh, we will draw some uh, mucus from the cervix and then we put on a slide, put a cover slip over that and examine under the high power microscope. You, if you see so many motile spermatozoa, uh, then that is positive. That means male factor is mostly excluded. But if you see only very few sperms or more sperms, without any motility, if they're just lying dead like uh, thing, then uh, it, is, it is significant. We have to plan treatment for that. Next slide, please. So how do, uh, what, how do you treat if you find uh, anti-sperm antibodies? Actually, uh, we don't treat with steroids. You can do one thing to reduce the exposure of the sorry. Uh, hello. Hello. Yes, sir. We can hear you, sir. Okay, okay. The calls coming. The thing is, like, uh, yeah, where are we? When we find anti-sperm antibodies in the women's cervix and all, what we need to do is we advise the couple to use condoms in the non-fertile period so that there will be less exposure of the sperm to the uh, female genital tract and all. So occasional exposure may not give rise to anti-sperm antibodies that significantly. Uh, you know, people with bilateral or unilateral cryptorchidism. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah. Next, next slide, please. Yeah, sperm granulomas at the vasectomy site is another evidence of cell-mediated immunity. It represents a dynamic structure and a site of spermatozoal phagocytosis. Spermatozoa exposed to cytokines such as tumor necrosis factor and interferon G, uh, they show impairment motility and inability to penetrate to hamster eggs. Despite all this, the full-blown full -blown spectrum of cell-mediated immunity is difficult to prove in the laboratory tests and more sophisticated investigations are needed in order to detect the impact of cellular mediated immunity in men with unexplained infertility. Next slide, please. And there is a deficient sperm function. You know, in spite of uh, the normal morphology as well as count and motility being normal, uh, if the couple is not achieving pregnancy, then we have to go for sperm function testing. They are like, uh, they're kinkily useful as well as such tests are used to distinguish between fertile and infertile men and to aid in showing the cause of male subfertility and in suggesting therapeutics. Sperm function tests are like to test for the DNA integrity and reactive oxygen species. Acrosome reaction and zonopelicida binding, they are done in only few specialist centers. Our topic of, topics of interest are like DNA fragmentation index and reactive oxygen species. 
at present time. Next slide, please. And we can, in the conventional semen analysis, in the morphology, when we see there is excess residual cytoplasm that indicates aneuploidy of the spermatozoa. This is one important point we have to note. When there is excess residual cytoplasm to the sperm, like more than two in the high power field, that means it is significant. Next slide, please. So the chromosomal complement, the risk of sperm chromosomal aneuploidy is inversely related to sperm concentration and total progressive motility. This thing, yes, you know, the causes are like smoking, alcohol, chemotherapy, and aging. All these things will play a role in uh, increased ROS as well as cause of DNA damage as well as aneuploidy in the sperm. Next slide, please. So what we can change is uh, we can't change the genetics, but we can change our environment. So that smoking cessation, alcohol cessation, doing regular exercise and uh, um, taking supplements. All these things can make a lot of difference in the sperm function. Not just being morphology, maybe normal, but function needs to be improved. In Y chromosome infertility, the azospermia factor, AZFC region uh, in the short arm of Y chromosome is prone to many smaller subdeletions. Because, you know, smaller subdeletions, uh, we may not be able to detect in the regular uh, chromosome studies. But uh, they can cause a variety of combinations, like depending on the subdeletion, it can lead to a normal azospermia or it can lead to an azospermia. It, it indicates the need, the, it indicates the factor that uh, interaction of the environment and genetics. There is always uh, interaction between the genetics and environment. So even uh, a mildly problematic uh, per male, I mean that his genetics are not normal, still if he improves the environment, he can become much more functional in the fertility aspect. Next slide, please. So most chromosomal abnormalities may be detected by using one of the following methods. Sperm karyotyping for numerical abnormalities, fluorescence in situ hybridization for numerical as well as structural abnormalities. Quantitative PCR, which is a promising technique to detect the damage to nuclear and mitochondrial DNA. These are all like in specialist centers only they do. Yeah, next slide, please. DNA integrated effects also we'll discuss in the later slides. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Uh, the sperm chromatin structure is a method like tunnel and flow cytometry. They are, these are the objective tests at present in the clinical use at present. That too available. So reactive, reactive oxygen species. Hello? Hello? Yes, sir. We can hear you, sir. Yeah. Reactive oxygen species and reactive nitrogen species are the, uh, they are the free radicals which are developed within the sperm and within the, any cell actually for that matter because of its metabolism itself. They are not created somewhere and they are downloaded to some other place. They are created within the cell. So uh, you can't make it like zero. You can't, you can't avoid it altogether, but we shouldn't keep it at a very high level. So every cell and including sperm for that matter have a capacity to deal with the reactive oxygen species. But when its capacity levels are overwhelmed, then it, crea it creates oxidative stress and uh, that will lead to that will lead to a reduction in the function of the spermatozoa and any cell for that matter next slide please so there are so next slide please next slide please yeah next slide please yes there are so many insulting agents 
and uh, sperm to produce oxidative stress you know environmental lifestyle and systemic pathologies like diabetes malignancy any infection and uh, all these things pollution radiation uh, all these things will increase the oxidative stress on the sperm that will give rise to dysfunction but the point to be noted here is the sperm count motility and morphology are normal in this patient so we so that's what we are again stressing that we can't take it for granted that these are normal so we have to reduce the oxidative stress if possible or we have to treat the oxidative stress by means of supplements that point will come to later next slide please yes these are the reactive oxygen species here they mentioned but uh, reactive nitrogen species and so many other sulfur uh, molecules so many other thio thio molecules all these things can lead to, can give rise to oxidative stress so next slide please so how do we reduce the oxidative stress or how do we cope with the available or existing oxidative stress uh, next slide please this oxidate yeah this oxidative stress reactive oxygen species molecule they cause uh, mitochondrial membrane dysfunction that will give rise to all the problems mitochondria you know are powerhouses of the cell and they are very important in producing energy and that will lead to very good function of the sperm in me by not just by means of motility but uh, hyperactivation acrosome reaction ulema flow fusion all these require very good mitochondrial function next slide please yes uh, the sperm has a long way to go uh, once it enters into the female genital tract from the male genital tract first of all it has to large itself in the cervical mucus it has to swim all the way through the mucus and then it has to reach the endometrial cavity then into the oviduct and then uh, it has to detach itself from the oviduct membrane and then uh, it has to find the oocyte by means of chemotaxis then it has to get attached to that then it has to drill the oviduct zona pellucida which is very hard actually and then enter into the oocyte so all this is a very tedious job and uh, sperms without very good uh, mitochondrial function cannot reach that long they will fall somewhere short and that will lead to infertility so next slide please so zona pellucida binding defects and all are like uh, these are these are the ones actually you know um, they done in very few centers uh, it's more of theoretical interest and uh, next slide please next slide please capacitation yeah that's what we discussed actually capacitation is a combination of many processes where a normal sperm acquires a hyperactivated motility it is uh, it is not just a linear motility it is uh, uh, motility more of horizontal motility with high amplitude of lateral head displacement so defects in capacitation explain subfertility in some normal spermic man yeah these are defects in the hyperactivation or acrosome reaction all these things are like uh, these all are proposed but uh, these are difficult to prove at the particular moment next slide please so yeah hyperactivated spermatozoa can be distinguished from non hyperactivated ones by their high curvilinear velocity low linearity and large amplitude of lateral head displacement that's what i was discussing the clinical significance is uh by the ivf outcomes and spontaneous pregnancy rates actually you know every month if the couple are having regular intercourse one ivf is happening inside the body you know that is what next slide please 
and acrosome reaction that acrosome is having so many enzymes and it after binding to the zona pellucida it will release all the enzymes and it will there will be chemical drilling as well as the high flagellar motility aids in uh, penetrating through the zona uh, after the chemical drilling and all uh, there will be um, ulema and uh, acrosome fusion and later the sperm nucleus enters into the <coughs> into the oocyte that is called syngamy so next slide please so once there is acrosome reaction insufficiency uh, then that will lead to again infertility next slide please so there are so many defects can be present in the fuse fusogenic ability of the acrosome reacted sperm with the ulema these uh, these are like fusion and then penetration through the ulema and decondensation within the cytoplasm of the oocyte requires so much of uh, um, so much of uh, being normal that is sperm uh, euploidy as well as very good mitochondrial function next slide please next slide please yes next slide please so what is the practical approach for assessment of men with unexplained infertility post coital test as i already mentioned if appropriately performed and timed can be the initial test for couples with unexplained male infertility cervical mucus is normally hostile we all know to the sperm except near the ovulation time the absence of sperm on pct in the presence of normal seven parameter suggests incorrect coital technique or failure to ejaculate into the vagina whereas the presence of normal sperm numbers but reduced motility or a shaking motion and a pct suggest for the presence of anti sperm antibodies the finding of a normal pct raises the possibility of functional sperm defect so the first step to know the functional sperm defect is to check the competence of sperm before fertilization by means of ros and dfi dna fragmentation index the second step is the fertilization potential of the sperm especially when there is a failure of the ivf next slide please zona binding sa capacitation hyperactivation motility all these things next slide please so how do we work up for unexplained male fertility do a pct if it is normal uh then you can do uh, you can try uh, so many antioxidants which i'm going to discuss elaborate in the coming slides then reassess okay next slide please the treatment strategies uh they are not typical for everyone we have to um, we have to uh, judge we have to judge based on so many things like uh how how where you are located and uh, how capable they are of uh, paying all this and because you know many tests are like expensive tests and not available easily to everyone so you can you have to individualize the treatment according to the requirement of the couple because uh, you know if uh, 3 million count if someone comes that is uh, and is not able to undergo all this treatment then we can straight away go for donor insemination but of course that comes in the last so as already mentioned a detailed medical history is very helpful to disclose any hidden problems such as sexual dysfunction and inadequate coital habits next slide please and uh, what is required is the expectant management expectant management is uh, you know uh, masterly inactivity it's not like doing nothing we do something and we wait expectantly because pregnancies are taking place even without interventions in unexplained infertility up to 50% in a 3 year period provided the female age is less I mean less than 30 cumulative pregnancy rate is around 60% in 2 years but uh, infertility periods longer than 3 years are associated with low pregnancy rates especially the female is more than 35 or 
even older. So we will initially what we do, give a supplement, wait for a couple of years. If the female is permits. Uh, yeah, next slide, please. And the interventional management includes uh, if there is a varicocele, yes, we can go ahead with uh, micro surgical varicocele ligation. Uh, there are many experts available like us in, in the metros and many cities. They can do that. Not like, uh, um, not with the naked eye. It's a micro surgical one, which is the best one proven in the many varieties of laparoscopy, many, many varieties of varicocele treatment. Laparoscopic varicocele ligation and naked eye varicocele ligation and embolization are not proven to be of very good benefit to the patient. Next slide, please. So, next slide, please. When there is, yeah, it has been shown that steroids are not useful when you find antisperm antibodies. Don't treat the patient. Don't, don't, don't give steroids. Hello? Yes, sir. Hello? We, can you, sir. we can hear you. Yeah, yeah. Don't give steroids, either high dose or low dose to the patients. Uh, with when you suspect antisperm antibodies because they have so many side effects and uh, not much useful in the uh, purpose to be solved. So methods to remove antisperm antibodies are to wash the sperm and most of the antisperm antibodies present in the, the seminal plasma will go and uh, but not the ones which are attached they may not go but IUI is one option you can consider because in the double den double density centrifugation will uh, re remove most of the antisperm antibodies and in the IUI you can bypass the cervical hostile cervical mucus so you can go ahead with IUI in the initial stages and later, again, ICSI is one of the options. Next slide, please. That is, ICSI, ICSI will bypass all these steps. So one, once the sperm is of euploid nature, ICSI will give rise to good chance of pregnancy. So next slide, please. When there is excess oxidative stress, how do we know excess oxidative stress? will? Uh, Check for ROS if the facility is available within our uh, city. Or else, uh, you will again ask if he is smoking, either to say, say stop the smoking or uh, stop taking alcohol or at least reduce the dose. And uh, you will advise to have regular medication which we are going to describe. Next slide, please. So, this is all theory part of it. And uh, yeah, next slide, next slide. Next. Next slide, next slide. Next. Yeah. In, in case of oxidative stress, in, I mean, current evidence links oxidative stress to male infertility, reduced sperm motility, all that thing. Uh, is already proven in the clinical trials as well. Next slide, please. Yeah. When there is excess of oxidative stress in the testicular microenvironment, that will uh, cause deficiency in the spermatogenesis as well as to damage the DNA as well as the morphology is damaged. This is the expert opinion worldwide. Next slide, please. So what we need to take is antioxidants for the protection because we can't, when we can't reduce the production of uh, reactive oxygen species and oxidative stress, we can use at least scavenge that. That way we can make a cleaner environment for the sperm. Next slide, please. 
yeah endogenous always formation you cannot stop but you can minimize and you can always do the direct scavenging effect by means of antioxidants next slide please yeah one of the best uh, antioxidants available are an l carnitine it is the one it is a main energy source for the spermatozoa in the uh, epididymis okay it is required uh, for successful maturation of the sperm because sperm is matured in the epididymis only because it is uh, l carnitine is necessary for the transport of fatty acids into the mitochondria uh, that will produce energy low levels of l carnitine are associated with reduced sperm motility next slide please coenzyme q10 uh, this is a vital antioxidant it's it's present coenzyme is actually ubiquinol it's present everywhere that's why it is called ubiquinol it's called it is particularly present at high concentration in sperm mitochondria uh, because of its requirement and uh, next slide please selenium is a major constituent of specific group of proteins selenoproteinases and all and uh, these seleno enzymes are required for the antioxidant function to be maintained next slide please zinc is an essential trace element and uh, it reduces the apoptosis as well as it maintains the signal transduction what is the signal transduction when the there is fsh and lh produced within the pituitary and it comes down reaches the testes and with uh, when zinc is there abundantly then this signal is transduced into the testicular uh, cells so next slide please lycopene lycopene is one of the phytochemical it is present in tomatoes and other red fruits uh, it it is one of the carotenoid which is a very important antioxidant yes next slide please allergenin it's a semi essential next slide please yes allergenin is a semi essential amino acid uh, it has a direct vasodilatation effect as well as antioxidant effect so allergenin is one of the very important uh, ingredients it is not only useful for the sperm quality to become better it also increases the nitric it is a nitric oxide donor so it it helps in erectile dysfunction also next slide please and the management of unexplained male subjectivity because of dna damage often requires art that is assisted reproduction therapy so i i crt means i u a next slide please next slide yeah this slide okay go back go back yeah so the i u i is the first step of art then is the icc later comes the imc and icc okay so next slide please so defects in sperm dna may be a single strand break or double strand break uh, so double strand breaks are difficult to repair single strand breaks can be easily repaired next slide please next slide please once there is high dna fragmentation it can lead to immortality and uh, there is uh a holistic approach to treat sperm dna fragmentation is by means of giving these antioxidants you know vitamin d3 is not just a vitamin it is like a hormone also and uh, you know astaxanthin i will come to few conclusions uh in the next slide yeah i what i speak is i mean what i tell you tell you is number 1 if he is a smoker and he is not able to quit smoking give astaxanthin 16 mg per day if he has lower motility and uh, not improved by other things give l carnitine 2 grams per day if he is having next slide uh next slide 
Next slide. Next slide. Next. Yes. Next slide. Next, please. Next. Yeah. Next. Myoinestal. Previous slide. Yeah. Myoinestal. Myoinestal is a new hope, a new impetus to male fertility as well as female fertility. You know, the thing is, if he is having next slide, please. Yes. If there is less of myoinestal, it will lead to reduced fertility. Next slide. Myoinestal. What it does is next slide, please. In metabolic syndrome. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Yes, next slide. Yes. In metabolic syndrome, you know what is metabolic syndrome? There is insulin resistance as well as hypertension and uh, dyslipidemia. In metabolic syndrome, there is a deficiency of myonestal. And if you give surplus dose of myonestal, say, Yeah, hello. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Hello? Yeah, if we give two to four, hello? Yes, sir. You're audible, sir. Okay, okay. If we give two to four grams of myonestal per day in metabolic syndrome patients, uh, metabolic syndrome, what I clearly say is uh, if he is overweight, obese, uh, and uh, if he is a diabetic, or if he's not a diabetic, if he has a family history of diabetes strongly, then you choose myonestal. Four grams per day is ideal. And this will give rise to pan improvement of the all features. Next, next slide, please. And uh, yes, the shield people are coming with coming out with Java mates, which is having a unique combination of all these uh, ingredients. And that is highly suggestible. Next slide, please. And there are so many studies already they did, and the government is uh, proving itself. Yes. And in even if we give all these and try for a length of time, but uh, and try for a length of length of time, but still pregnancy is not happening. That means. Uh, that particular couple cannot have kids. This, uh, this we will come to this conclusion. We can arrive only after repeated as attempts of failure of ICSI. Then the next slide, please. Still one more option left. That is donor insemination. This will, this will rule out uh, the previous uh, problems and uh, they can have a healthy baby. Thank you for patient hearing. So I don't know. Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for your uh, excellent and superlative talk. It was, uh, I mean, uh, very well explained uh, regarding the unexplained male infertility, okay. which uh, regarding okay. unforget man, uh, forgetting man. So, sir, okay. uh, if you allow me, then we'll take the questions from the delegates. No problem. Yes, go ahead with questions. Okay. 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 So we have a first question that is. Uh, when do we do this uh, testicular biopsy? Testicular biopsy is nowadays, it uh, doesn't have any role. Because, you know, uh, if the FSH is low, that means it can be hypo-hypo. FSH, LH, testosterone, we will test all these three hormones. If, uh, if these three, all the three hormones are low, that means it is... Uh, problem with hypothalamus or pituitary. If FSH and LH are high and testosterone are low, that means primary testicular failure, like clinic filters and other things. And if these all these three are high, it is not practically possible unless the patient is having supplements, testosterone supplements. So the role of biopsy is not there, but you can try TISA to find out in case of normal. FSH, normal LH, normal testosterone, normal volume of the testis in, in scrotal Doppler, uh, still is experiment. Okay. 
then you have to do tisa and find out whether the sperm being produced is normal or not sometimes what happens is there will be a maturation arrest and this maturation arrest you can find out by means of tisa and uh, when you don't find mature sperm there that uh, with adequate testicular volume say more than 10 ml or so then we come to a conclusion that there is a maturation arrest and uh, maturation arrest cannot be dealt with uh, any known treatments so what we do is we think of alternate modalities thank you very much sir okay we have one more question that is uh, uh, ideal approach in uh, cc resistant male infertility patient clomiphene citrate resistant male infertility yes actually you know clomiphene clomiphene cc that's what he means right yes sir yeah clomiphene citrate we give only when there is low fsh or lh and a normal uh, low testosterone like that if the fsh is less than 2.1 then we can give clomiphene citrate to boost up uh, release of fsh from the pituitary clomiphene citrate is basically an crm selective estrogen receptor modifying drug so that can increase the fsh release from the pituitary so if it is resistant to that that means in case of high fsh patients say if fsh is already 15 or 20 then there is no point in giving clomiphene citrate to that patient okay so if the fsh is low and still not responding then we have to think of a lesion in the pituitary or hypothalamus and we can we have to do mri if there is a prolactin rise then we have to do um, mri scan and if we find a prolactinoma then we can treat it with capgolin and that will respond favorably okay thank you sir okay sir i don't find any additional questions from the delegates so if you allow me then we will close this webinar okay then thanks a lot for doing taking all these pains to conduct the webinar and yes. thank you so much dr kinera somsekar someshwar and ambati akaya and uh, we are krishnan mangate krishnan yeah uh, we are we are very glad to have you here sir and uh, we look further to have more webinars with you sir and thank you thank you once again sir and i also thank all the delegates who are participating in this webinar and okay. many thank you so much okay. thank you sir bye thank you